Welcome everyone. And thank you for joining this special webinar in which we reflect on sustainability science in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Wherever you are, we hope you are safe and healthy during these strange and challenging times. My name is Sharon Collins. I am a professor of environmental studies at the University of Colorado Boulder and the exec executive director for the Earth Leadership Program. On behalf of this event and all of the panelists, I want to begin by acknowledging that I, can't, I am coming to you all from my home, which sits upon land within the territories of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. I acknowledge that 48 contemporary tribal nations are historically tied to the lands that make up the state of Colorado. I'm very pleased to be moderating this timely discussion. The ongoing pandemic has touched virtually every aspect of modern life and has opened an important space for serious reflection on the role of science, especially the fields that center on sustainability issues within our changing world. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Earth Leadership Program, we are a relatively new venture of Future Earth with a bold mission to scale up the impact of academic researchers to solve sustainability challenges. The Earth Leadership Program uses a collective leadership framework and systems thinking to empower global change researchers to bring knowledge to impact. As a direct evolution of the influential Leopold Leadership Program, we are now aiming to take this program global, supporting regional networks of exceptional mid-career sustainability scientists as they create change through engagement with policy, governance, commerce, and culture. Applications for the 2021 North American cohort are open now with the submission deadline of May 29th. For me, one of the best things about being an Earth Leadership Fellow is the opportunity to work alongside some of the brightest minds in science. And I'm very happy to be joined today by a distinguished panel that will help us explore where sustainability science is headed in a post-COVID world. But before I introduce our speakers, some quick things to note. First, everyone is on mute except for our speakers. We strongly advise you not to open any links that are shared in the chat box. We will send a follow-up email with any cleared links that may be brought up during the speaker's remarks or during the discussion. We invite you to submit your questions and comments to the question and answer box, which you can find at the lower right side of your Zoom page. Our team will collate these questions and offer them for discussion during the second half of the webinar after our four speakers have given their remarks. Please feel free to add questions anytime during the discussion and let us know if the question is for a particular panelist. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce my respected colleagues in the order of their presentations. First, Dr. Alan Townsend is provost and interim president elect at Colorado College. He is an environmental scientist who studies how ecosystems work, how they are changing and what those changes might mean for society. He is a highly cited author of more than 130 peer-reviewed articles on topics that include the biogeochemistry of tropical forests and global scale analyses of human impacts on major element cycles. Alan is a strong advocate of academic engagement beyond the ivory tower. He was an Aldo Leopold Leadership Fellow in 2001 and one of the inaugural Google Science Communication Fellows in 2011. Dr. Patricia romero Lancao is a senior research scientist at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. From a behavioral science perspective, she examines the interactions among people, mobility, the built environment, and energy systems, as well as their resilience to disruptive events. Throughout her career, she has developed a considerable body of highly regarded interdisciplinary research, resulting in several research grants, and more than 130 peer-reviewed publications. Dr. Jonathan Patz is a professor and director of the Global Health Institute at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. He co-chaired the Health Report for the first congressionally mandated US National Assessment on Climate Change and served as founding president of the International Association for Ecology and Health. Jonathan also served as a lead author for the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. He is also a recipient, recipient of the Aldo Leopold Leadership Fellows Award, and in 2019 was elected into the National Academy of Medicine. 
And Dr. Lisa Gromlich is Dean of the College of the Environment at the University of Washington. Her primary research interests are in paleoecology and the ways that ecosystems and human societies adapt to climate change with a special focus on severe and persistent drought. She pioneered the use of tree ring data to understand long-term trends in climate, focusing on the mountains of Western North America. She has an interdisciplinary focus and a career long interest in global climate change, especially with regard to how to best manage natural and human resources in an uncertain future. She was named an Aldo Leopold Leadership Fellow in 1999 and was elected as Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, in 2004, and the American Geophysical Union's Board of Directors in 2017. So I'll now turn to Dr. Alan Townsend, who will be our first presenter. Alan. Thanks so much, Sharon. Um, and hey, everybody, thanks for joining us today. It really, it's an honor for me to be part of this. And before I get started, I just wanted to say to everybody watching or listening, thanks again for joining us. And I hope you and yours are well. Um, may you have others to lean on. May you get through this as the best you can be. And, and may you find that this be that one unicorn of a Zoom meeting that's actually worth your time. Uh, my, my charge today is to kick the four of us off and set the stage for some deeper dives from Patty and Jonathan and Lisa. And as such, I don't wanna take too much of your time. But I do wanna start by telling a brief story. A few weeks back, I got a call from a high school student and her father. And this is a young woman who wants to be a biomedical engineer. And she's really inspired by the current pandemic to invent new technologies that will save lives. And she and her dad basically wanted to know would a liberal arts education help her achieve that goal? Or in other words, should she come to Colorado College or should she go to a big engineering school? My answer and the reason I'm sharing this today um, was went well beyond her college choice. I spoke to her of the power of science, uh, of how essential it is to nearly every aspect of our modern lives. And she really didn't need any convincing there. But then I told her science is not enough and scientists have got to reach beyond their realm. And as part of this, I shared two quotes with her. One was from a pretty recent National Academies report on integrating the humanities and arts with science, medicine, and engineering. And for me, the take home line from this report is as follows. The educated workforce of the future needs to be able to solve the challenges of the world with the vision of a scientist, the discipline of an engineer, the heart of a humanist, and the creativity of an artist. And then in perhaps annoyingly liberal arts fashion, I dusted off some high school English memories and shared a line from Camus' The Plague, and it was this. The whole town rushed outside to celebrate this crowded minute when the time of suffering had ended and the time of forgetting had not yet begun. That moment is somewhere on our horizon. When, we don't know. But we do know that the when depends a lot on our own behavior and on how we learn and lead. So for the rest of my time today, I want to talk about a few things I hope we don't forget. The first. Those of us in science have got to remember where our expertise lies and where it doesn't. And that matters both within scientific disciplines and as I'll get to in a moment, beyond them. For the within, the whole point of today, as I hope you'll see unfold across our speakers and the subsequent discussions, is to reinforce how this moment in time has a lot to teach us across a wide range of scientific arenas that are relevant to sustainability. And that those very same areas have much to offer our path forward. However, when the stakes are this high, we can't pretend to be something we're not. For example, to be a little blunt that I know has circulated some, just because somebody's got good quantitative or statistical skills doesn't suddenly make them an epidemiologist. A core principle of sustainability science is that transdisciplinarity matters a whole lot. But embedded in that principle is the need to trust and support and elevate those who know a given arena best. Put another way, we need to stay in our lanes while helping to ensure that the road ahead has got a whole lot of lanes upon it. Second, and please forgive the war analogy here because typically I hate them, but for me, the pandemic has made our sustainability battle lines crystal clear. It's become the starkest example I've yet seen of how for way too many, facts simply don't matter. Scientists, you know, we're, we're shaped by an enduring faith in the power of evidence and fact. And deep down, I think we all think that facts surrounding say a degrading planet will become so self-evident that real change will eventually emerge. And, and happily for many, I think that's true. And yet here we sit with people dying all around us, 
with friends and neighbors risking and losing their lives on the front lines of healthcare and more. And while a large fraction of our country is still willing to ignore, deny, or intentionally suppress what couldn't be more clear. We've got to better internalize this depressing reality and begin to work both with and against it. And in this country anyway, the pandemic is very clearly demonstrating how the willful dismissal of facts, an epidemic of its own right, is perhaps the biggest barrier to a more sustainable world. How do we deal with that? Well, in part, by remembering that turning science into action, be that in response to a pandemic or a heating planet, is ultimately a human problem. It requires that we also listen to historians who remind us of how human tipping points can be every bit as precipitous as those of our planet, or to sociologists and economists and political scientists who can reveal why we make or, or we don't many of the decisions in front of us, or to poets and novelists who hold up mirrors that reveal who we truly are if we only choose to look, to feminist scholars and critical race theorists who reveal truths that we ourselves too often set aside, and to artists who open our hearts to sudden bursts of emotion that let us consider facts in wholly new ways. And the end, that's how we really work as human beings. More often than not, to, to reach the head, you've got to go through the heart. And there really is, I think, a hopeful new chorus in all of this of listen to the scientists. But I also think that many of those listening in new ways are doing so because this moment in time pierced their hearts, not their minds. And we see at the same time that the pandemic is becoming only the latest example of forces that'll stop at just about nothing to close those hearts and separate them into camps where they open only to those who align with a common worldview. For every cry to let science guide our way, there's an example of those who are choosing ideology over data, hate over inclusion, or nationalism over global cooperation. Just look at the divides which have emerged around reopening states and the choices that many are making. It's really depressingly familiar stuff for those of us who work on climate and the environment. And to be clear, I, you know, I'm not saying that the pandemic has drained my hope for finding more sustainable paths. It really hasn't. And I know Lisa will, as Lisa will discuss in a bit, there's a lot in the current moment that can and should give us some new forms of confidence going forward. But I also do think that COVID-19 is telling us that in some ways, the fight might even be harder than we thought, which means to me that, yes, we have to meet people where they are. As some in our community have demonstrated and said so well, look, for example, what Catherine Hayhoe has managed to do with climate change. But we also have to be willing to embrace strategies of influence that are known to work, even if they make us a bit uncomfortable. And doing so doesn't have to mean a loss of scientific integrity. If we don't begin to better engage the toolboxes of those who understand things like counter PR, marketing, political change, too often we're just going to be left shouting from the sidelines. And here's something I think we've all got to shout louder and work even harder to change. COVID-19 is only the latest heartbreaking and, and honestly quite shameful example of the inequities that define our nation and world, of our history of racism, and of policies and decisions which continue to reinforce that racism. In this country, we're seeing the pandemic causing Asian communities to be targeted with hate and violence, while African-American, Latinx, and Native and Indigenous communities are being hit disproportionately hard. And the mortality rate for Black Americans is nearly three times that for white. And a growing number of states, same is true for Latinx Americans. And for Native and Indigenous communities, we don't even truly know because they are being left out of state data or categorized as other, which is yet one more erasure in a long and awful history of just that. But there too, the data we do have suggests a really heavy toll. And all of this, of course, has nothing to do with the biology of the virus and everything to do with the inequities we continue to allow. Make no mistake, those inequities harm our search for solutions too be that to a pandemic or more broadly to a sustainable world. An analysis out just this week in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences demonstrated that, and I quote here, demographically underrepresented PhD students innovate at higher rates than majority students, but their novel contributions are discounted and less likely to earn them academic positions. These are just all screamingly loud examples of how sustainability goals are not morally acceptable, pragmatically possible, nor most quickly and fully realized without resting wholly upon a foundation of equity and social justice. Full stop there for me. Finally, some of you are joining us today because you're in leadership positions yourself, or perhaps you hope to be so in the future. When it comes to leadership, no matter the scope or level, this moment has only strengthened for me something I've long believed and sought to practice. As leaders, we've got to be willing to lay ourselves bare, to be vulnerable, to lead with our hearts as well as our minds. 
leadership and practice can way too often invite forces that threaten to wall us off from the very people we seek to help. In no shortage of leadership training programs, you'll even find advice to do that. Things like don't take it personally or separate yourself to allow sound decisions and all that. And it all can sound really reasonable in the moment, but beware of where this can take you. More than ever, we have to take it personally. In times of crisis above all, people need permission to be messy and imperfect and real. By giving ourselves that permission, we take some new risks, no doubt. But if we won't take them, how do we expect others to? I've learned, sometimes the hard way, that often the best path to breakthroughs or to building the kinds of community ties we really need is just to stick yourself out there, warts and all, to admit your failings, your struggles, your own inevitable messiness, just for us to be human. All right, with that, I really do want to keep my promise to be brief because I know my colleagues on the panel are going to have some great insights to share. Uh, so thanks for listening and for joining us today. And now I'm going to pass the baton to Patty. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for this wonderful introduction. Um, I, I, I want to call my presentation sustain, uh, Sustainability in the Times of the COVID-19, inspired by uh, Garcia Marquez, uh, a great novelist who always I follow and who really is, is, is the best storyteller. And I hope I can tell you a couple of stories here. And I will be sharing some of the ideas that Alan was already presenting so nicely. First of all, I, I really think that the crisis unleashed by COVID-19 throws light on whatever is broken in our society. And we need to acknowledge that and understand that. We have been confronted with decades of underfunded health systems that don't have the resources to respond not only to this COVID-19, but to many other disasters and threats we are faced with. We also have a safety nets that are not enough to allow people to pursue their lives with dignity and to respond to and perceive risks. So and another important thing, and this is something uh, I'm seeing more and more uh, discussed, is that COVID is showing us that our globally driven supply chains that have really focused so much on a supply chain optimization and just-in-time approaches to have really reduced inventories are not working any longer. In prior research we did on the impacts of hurricanes, uh, global impacts on hurricanes, we found the same. We found that we can not only depend on China on, on remote places to get the products we need. We need to rethink those models, and this is really now so evident with the COVID-19. Uh, Alan already referred to the um, uh, social inequalities and political injustices, uh, and they are at the heart of many responses we have seen in Europe with the Brexit and also in the US. I think that many people, and I don't only think, but we are really clear that uh, excluded communities, uh, people of color, Hispanics, Latinos like me, are really uh, feeling excluded and they are not enjoying the benefits of globalization. Looking ahead, um, what lessons can be drawn uh, from what we are experiencing? The traumatic encounter with the borderless COVID-19 might become another blow and a major reason to rethink the globalized, liberalized systems we have promoted in the last decades. And we already were seeing uh, before COVID-19 hit us, a new emphasis on country first politics and new barriers to trade and investments. As I already told you, many people, many social scientists like me are calling for the need to revise our global supply chains, to create buffers, to make them flexible, to create redundancies that allow us to absorb disruptions. And we know from our work on climate change that more and more we will be faced with very intense extreme events that will pose challenges to our life and our production systems the way we know it. So we need to revise those global supply chains. Um, 
And a, a, a key element that we need to consider here is that we all talk about the need to have global cooperation and global governance models, but we have been seeing, and COVID-19 brings that more to the fore, that we are facing challenges in our efforts to coordinate coordinate action. So we need to revise this and we need to, I don't know how to do it, but we need to think of how to address the mismatch between our ability to create risks and our capacity to address them. Uh, at the same time, the crisis, the crisis offers a once in a generation opportunity to foster a sustainable transition or many sustainable transitions. I could say, given that I come from Mexico where sometimes we don't like people telling us what the transition would look like, we are at a crossroads. And I think that while the momentum of deep change may be unstoppable, the road forks in multiple overlapping contradictory directions. And I want to just mention some I see when putting my, my lens, my, my, my focusing on the future. Either we seize the new opportunities open up, for instance, we tie recovery support to a green transition, and that's something Europe is already discussing. We can help producers and consumers move, for instance, toward renewables and hydrogen. We can electrify everything create jobs in electric charging stations, in a public alternative micromobility uh, as uh, transportation systems. We create, we put rooftops in, uh, uh, rooftop solar panels. We retrofit our buildings. We also could harness the emerging behavioral changes that we are witnessing, working remotely, reducing our amount of travel, social distancing, or I would better say, physically, physical distancing while social connecting. We could do that. And we could also uh, 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 address the vulnerabilities that we are learning from, the, uh, the vulnerabilities in our governance systems. We know we are learning from COVID-19 that countries that are able to have the knowledge, the monitoring systems, the toolkits, the kits to, 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 to uh, detect uh, COVID-19 that, that have leadership, that are uh, proactive, that enact coordinated policy action are being more effective at addressing these and other challenges. So we have this huge opportunity, but there are other options that we are confronted with and we need to also be aware of them. We could do business as usual, save corporate capitalism that has not constrained, not balanced with the state and with civil society and with the environment. And let this talking of fear and xenophobia feed the resurgent nationalism that we are seeing popping up everywhere in the world. We could also allow all these to take us out and down into breakdown. And I don't think that being the leaders we are, the caring people we are, we want this to happen. But for us to avoid this, I think we need to also ask ourselves a key question. And this is the last question, the last question I want to close my presentation with. How can science engage to enact these multiple positive transitions? And my answer, and, and, and here I really resonate with Alan's comments, we need to be more humble and nimble. We need to understand the limits of science and accept that transitions are messy and contested endeavors. And that, and this is where social sciences can complement what physical sciences and engineers, engineers do. We need to understand that actions by many stakeholders, by many actors are not necessarily and uniquely driven by rational considerations. Values, identities, feelings, fears, loyalties, all these also matters. People's understanding and action are mediated by their cultural, political, family and clique identities. This poses the challenge of how can we engage with the others, with the ones we don't resonate with. 
Political ideologies also matter. They create rationals that are at the heart of enthusiasm for actions that might be counterintuitive from a longer term sustainability perspective, but we need to engage with those. And let me tell you, I'm not good at that, but I am learning to engage with those voices. And lastly, we also need to be aware that not everything is nice communication and let's work together with the community. If that was the case, we wouldn't be faced with these big challenges. We need to understand the influence of powerful forces that are behind the lack of or the existence of inadequate and limited policies. Rule making everywhere involves extensive lobbying and we need to understand how this operates in order to engage in different coalitions. And this we need to do not only as scientists, but as citizens, as people who care deeply for our children, for our neighbors, for our friends. And in this, we of course need to analyze, analyze and follow the money trail, right? Because we need to figure out who is asking for what, who is getting what they want and whose needs are excluded. And we need to engage in efforts seeking to address this and to overcome it. I know we need to do many things, and I hope that by engaging this, in this conversation, we together can create the, the means we need to, contrib to better contribute to a sustainable future or to many sustainable futures. Thank you. Hi, it's uh, Jonathan Patz here, and uh, I'm quite serious about the title of this presentation, Without Reversing Environmental Damages, Mark Your Calendars for the Next Pandemic, because this is all about the environment. And in fact, those protected health workers that are looming over the, the forest, the damaged forest, that's an intentional cover photo. This was taken uh, one month ago. This is actually an NBC uh, special uh, where they highlighted our research over the Amazon. Uh, this documentary actually was highlighting my former student, uh, Dr. Amy Vitor, where we showed a link between deforestation in the Amazon and the emergence of malaria. Again, this is something where you change the environment and you, you see a disease risk. Our findings were that we looked at deforestation and the degree of deforestation in the Amazon. Um, after controlling for human population density and other factors, we found that the dangerous mosquito species, the Anopheles darlingi mosquito that carries malaria, increased dramatically in deforested areas. And a former a student after uh, Amy Vitor was Sarah Olson uh, from this study, finding that for every 1% of deforestation, there's an increased incidence rate or new cases of malaria, 11% uh, increase. And so this link between land use change and disease emerges, emergence leads me to our current pandemic, the COVID-19 emergence comes from disrupting nature. And first, I'm gonna be covering the proximate socio-ecological determinants of the emergence of this novel coronavirus now causing the COVID-19 pandemic. And then I'll, I'll talk a little bit more upstream, looking at upstream causal factors, which are human incursion into and disruption of nature. And finally, I'll talk about preventing the next pandemic and new opportunities revealed by our current situation. So we all know about the Chinese wet markets. Uh, this is partly because the Chinese government uh, has uh, made laws that actually promote domesticating wildlife. This was done for poor peasant farmers, uh, a program for, for them. So it's a bit of an industry. And you can see in this photo, um, you know, stacking wildlife on top of each other creates an unnatural environment for pathogens to spill over from one species 
to another. And I'll talk about that in a minute. On top of the domestic wildlife uh, industry, there is illegal wildlife trading. <clears throat> and this is a photo of the anteater, the, the pangolin. Uh, it's one of the most widely sold and now endangered species from illegal wildlife trade. And the next uh, image is a bit uh, disheartening. You can see all of these uh, killed pangolins. Um, and it turns out that today's uh, virus that's causing the pandemic, uh, it's almost a perfect match genetically with pangolin viruses. And if you combine bat, bat coronaviruses and pangolin, um, you know, it's closely related to pangolin, but very detailed genetic studies that have been coming out in, in nature and science show that this novel coronavirus, the mutations, are definitely not human engineered as, as some conspiracy theorists are suggesting. It is very much uh, looks like it's evolutionary within nature and it's most closely related to the pangolin virus. And of course, um, this is one image of one week of, of air travel. Uh, the virus emerged out of Wuhan and you can see this flight, these flight patterns and the rest is of the story we know most of the virus, uh, the genet genetics from the virus in the United States looks like it came from Europe primarily. The other part of the environmental story of, of uh, this pandemic is that right now we see a relationship between air pollution and mortality. And the top map is a map of air pollution. The bottom map is looking at um, death rates, uh, fatality rates of COVID. And the conclusion of this study that just came out of Harvard a few weeks ago, it was a striking finding. After controlling for human population density and income and a million other uh, confounding factors, this very well done study found that for every increase in just one microgram per cubic meter of fine particles, PM 2.5, there's a 15% increase in COVID death rate. So the bottom line here is that environmental factors are both at the front and back ends of the COVID-19 pandemic. So let's go a little deeper and go upstream and look at human incursions into and disruption of nature. And I love this, uh, this uh, image, uh, what the coronavirus pandemic tells us about our relationship with the natural world. Um, I'm going to show you a very important slide that comes from my colleague and friend, Professor Raina Plowright, who is an expert in the spillover of zoonotic diseases. Zoonotic diseases are diseases that come from animals. And what you're seeing here, if you're looking, looking on the left at those moving uh, plates there, starting from the top, you know, the reservoir host distribution, the animals that are actually carrying the pathogen, what is your distribution? And if you, if you deforest, you chop up a forest into fragments or you degrade landscapes and you force those animals, the wildlife, to move unnaturally, you have a change in their, their density. That's the next tile. And then if you have packed wildlife together, higher density, the prevalence of disease goes up. And uh, infection intensity, they may be shedding more viruses. So all of these top tiles um, are changing because of what we're doing to the landscape. And by disrupting habitats and destroying ecosystems, we are setting up a situation uh, that is more dangerous. And down a little lower on the brown tiles, you can see human exposure. So imagine you disrupt an ecosystem and you also uh, send bushmeat hunters into a jungle or you have more human interaction uh, or, you, uh, or you have the wet markets. All of these things align and you get one of these rare, but, but it does happen and it happened now with COVID-19, one of these spillover events with animal viruses uh, going into humans. So this is, this is the environmental, the, up, the front end environmental impact, why we have the current pandemic. Next slide. And, and this is not new. Uh, we've, we've known about these for a long time. This is a paper of ours from 16 years ago 
talking about unhealthy landscapes and the emergence of infectious diseases. So that's the front end. Now look at the back end here. Look at, this is a, an image that I know all of you have seen in the news, these pictures of, of New Delhi, India, you know, before the pandemic on the left and, and right now on, with all the, the shutdown of the global economy on the right. And what this shows you, I mean, what could be any clearer comparing today's air quality with business as usual? And from the World Health Organization, we know that air pollution causes 7 million premature deaths every year. And we see evidence uh, in other places. Look at uh, France and parts of Europe, uh, March of 2019 versus March of this year. Look at the reduction by satellite uh, images of, of nitrogen dioxide, much cleaner air. Also in the United States, March of last year compared to March of this year, the air is cleaner. And finally, who would imagine that these mega cities in India would all show good rating for air quality? Unbelievable. So when we see this, you know, we, we've shut down the global economy and you can see it's bottled up, you know? And at this time, do we really want to uncork the conventional fossil fuel economy? Or do we want to get to energy economy where we prosper? But this is a delicate time. And you think that, you know, will people fear the trade offs of solving yet another global crisis? I mean, it's taking, shutting down the global economy and many people losing their jobs to stop this pandemic. And so I wonder, especially with climate change, will people be afraid to say, Oh my God, do we have, what do we have to do to stop, you know, do we have to sacrifice that much? But I would argue that unlike COVID-19, combating climate change could be free, even a net gain. And I've been on this for a while, publishing how climate change, its challenges and opportunities for global health, and it's solving this crisis could be the greatest health opportunity of our times. And just a few months ago, how a low carbon future could improve global health and achieve economic benefits. So on my last slide, I saw this amazing image from a, an op-ed, why don't we treat climate change like an infectious disease? Because after all, climate change is a global health emergency. Thank you very much. How could I resist being part of a conversation that had as its core three words, this changes everything. And here we are in this new Zoom format where I'm speaking to, I guess, over 300 of you. Um, I am guessing that among us, some of these changes we've had in common, you know, many of you may and this, this changes everything world have some unique changes. Some of you may be experiencing changes that are painful, that are full of fear and anxiety. Um, but what we do have in common is that our world is altered at this point in a profound way and in a global way. And it raises a challenge to us to try to make sense of that. That's why we're gathered here today. So I am guessing We've got a lot of scientists here, or maybe we have what I'm gonna call friends of science. And we always start with what we do best. We're scientists. We, we've all been reading about pandemics. We've been thinking about how this helps us steer the course of our institutions forward. We are the friendly neighbor in our evening walks that's talking to our neighbors about why it's important to flatten the curve. We are being scientists. But there's something bigger going on here. And I would say to us, here we are, that we are uniquely positioned right now to change the relationship between science and society for the better. We need to move the needle on that bridging 
knowledge to action, and we need to sort of start tackling sustainability in new and profound ways. Okay, you have signed up for another Zoom in a life that is full of Zoom. And so I'm gonna assume you're hungry to take this on. So here we go. Here's what three opportunities look like. Opportunity, opportunity number one. Um, science is a global practice and we're already pretty good at this. The public has seen the scientific community be nimble and collaborative, rising to these amazing challenges. Way back when, remember the Chinese scientists sequenced the COVID-19 genome in literally days, and they made those data accessible to everyone to work on this. This is on some level amazing, but to those of us that have been working in this era of global science, this is regular. This is how we as Earth System Science work. Look at the Future Earth website and look at the globally scaled projects. Think about how it is that over the last decade, we've gotten used to this. We share data, we move, we, we address these questions. Scientists collaborate globally. Don't lose that thought. Opportunity number two, and this is something that all three of the previous speakers have alluded to, the path from that scientific research to policy and decision-making is at the very least a bumpy one, if not one that is completely fraught in ways that Patty in particular was so articulate in pointing out. And we need to do something about this. So recall, we sequenced the genome. At the University of Washington, my colleagues developed COVID tests literally in, in, in days. And the political hurdles to roll those tests out persist to this day. I started working on climate change 40 years ago. We still don't have a national or international coherent policy for either adaptation or mitigation, despite the fact, once again, already alluded to in these talks, that there are ways. So what can we do? And some of that path forward has to do with matching our science. As Patty said, I, I jotted it down with the capacity to understand these risks and under, start to uh, match it with the capacity to address those risks and to engage as scientists and as citizens. So this moment is one where the third opportunity arises. And that is about that science is leading to real behavior change based on a trust in science. So, the science that's coming out is in the form of data, and it's in the form of models, and it's in the form of estimates of uncertainty. And those, that information, that chunks of science, is being used to change people's behavior. It, it to be honest, it has surprised me. It is the biggest and best surprise that has come out of this terrible moment. In my state of Washington, our governor, Jay Inslee consulted scientists and acted decisively. Our University of Washington public health researchers made the case for flattening the curve and called for us to radically and immediately change our behavior at personal sacrifice and economic sacrifice. And we have done this. What's interesting is we've seen from journalists that the people that survey trust in public science, uh, trust in science, is that it's soaring. And it's interesting because it's, a, it's about the trust in science and science communication. It's not just that science was broadcasting results, but it was explaining the scientific process and the methods of science. Um, I have to share, I take my evening walks. I have a curmudgeon old guy walking his tiny little dog. He says to me the other night, Lisa, I've been thinking. He goes, all models are wrong, but some are useful. <laughs> he says, oh, really? <laughs> I've heard that before. And what, what got me excited was like, yes, it's, it's not just science literacy as do you know how many planets are in the solar system? 
it's about understanding that process that gives me hope. So trust is building, potentially is even at an all-time high relative to the last decade or so. And now is the time to build on that trust. I want to quote you from my favorite science communicator, Liz Neely, who wrote a great article on how to talk about coronavirus in the Atlantic. And Liz said, it has never been so important to get people to pay attention to hard truths. And perhaps it has never been as difficult to do that as it is right now. The key is to confront the most brutal facts of reality unflinchingly while maintaining an unwavering hope for the future. Look, there's tremendous suffering going on physically and mentally. People are coping with unexpected sadness, the huge unpredictability of the future. I'm not making light of that. But in these dark times, there are opportunities. And holding the public trust as scientists is a privilege. And it's an opportunity that will set us on the right course to tackle the future issues when science and informs and guides society. Thank you. Wonderful. I'd like to thank all four of you for your brilliant remarks and really provocative statements. We have a lot of questions that are starting to come in. And so I want to start um, with a question that a, that a couple of people have asked. Specifically, I'll start with, um, maybe we'll just go backward in the speaker order. Lisa, Jonathan, then Patty and Alan. What do you think the role of networks such as Future Earth or the Earth Leadership Program, what role can those networks play in triggering or co-triggering these changes that many of you ha have identified the need for in our society so as to reduce our vulnerability to some of the risks from COVID-19 and perhaps you could extend that risks of climate change. Lisa, do you wanna start with that? What's the role of, of networks in sort of fostering and co-triggering these changes? So I think they're absolutely critical. It's, it's part of one of the reasons that I sit on the board of the um, Earth Leadership Program and work to build out these networks because as individuals, we don't have singularly have the knowledge. And as Alan was so beautifully in pointing out, you know, it's not just science that is, is that sort of full range of, of um, sort of um, scholarly work as well as, as knowledge. I think networks help us to put together the kinds of information that allow us to understand our vulnerability and our pathways forward. But it's actually the networks then that for those of us as scientists that teach us and open us up to us the leadership opportunities that have to do with engaging not just as scientists but as citizens and i think that um that's something that is some of us like, do it intuitively but there's a whole lot of learned skills often informed by the kind of social science that patty and others have championed and and i'll just uh add to Lisa's comment her when she mentioned citizen we're also we have to be global citizens now and networks have to be very broad and we need to be um, you know very we have to be extremely well networked because everything is interdependent we're seeing with this pandemic the interdependence of uh, ecosystems and and uh, human behavior and trade and international travel and that it's so, you know, multifaceted in what's required, be it, uh, you know, economics, social science, um, understanding um, environment, things like that. So it's networks are important to reach beyond sectors, to reach beyond location uh, in this completely interconnected global challenge uh, without broad networks, uh, you know, we, we don't stand a chance in a, in a siloed world. We have to have a completely networked world. Points made about networks that um, we also need to pay attention to how to break the silo 
siloed networks, so to speak, like the eco chambers we each operate in, and 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 there are already tools, uh, particularly uh, tried. I have tried some of those for the COVID to work with people that believe in conspiracy theories, etc., and to do it in a way that is really humble and not arrogant, because sometimes we such scientists come across, not that we want, but we do, as arrogant. So I think that's a key point. And the other is to also connect people who are not so good at being in big settings, but that are really engaged and that use more personal uh, means to connect. So I think that these are two areas where we can start to work on the how to take advantage of networking as a key element of action. I think the, I, I agree with all of my colleagues here. Maybe the only thing I'll add that I've thought a fair amount about is this in the context of the Leopold network, and this doesn't necessarily apply to everyone, but for thinking about networks that I think can be most influential, or if you're designing them, that um, some of their greatest power can be in cultural change, um, not just an exchange in information. And, and you know, those are the things we need at every level, right? We need it, it, it kind of throughout the world to achieve sustainability. And, and there's just no question that in the case of the Leopold program, for example, I mean, had I not been in it, I'm sure I would have gone forward and done plenty of finding good things and done good science, but it totally changed my mindset and the kind of culture with which I thought about science. And when that is done and becomes large enough, cultures build upon themselves and they beget more. And, um, and I think that can be the most, some of the most powerful outcomes of networks right now and something we ought to be thinking about first in their design. Wonderful. Thank you all. I, I'm going to direct the next question to Patty and then um, others, please jump in because you've all talked about some form of transition, which I think is really fundamental to our current situation. This question says, what kind of incentive structures could be adopted to improve social capacity to achieve sustainability transitions from rapidly growing consumption and production centers in the global south? Wow, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a huge question. Well, I, I, something I have, I have learned when engaging in any alternative way to go from knowledge to action is to really start and connect climate change considerations with the needs and, the, and, and what is the, the priorities of people. Rather than thinking in terms of uh, incentives, I always think of, look, uh, climate change is key, for instance, because your community uh, and, and the, fa the, the, the port uh, your community depends on are affected, are already been affected by it. Or, you know, uh, electric, electric transportation is key for, your, for you to, co for, to connect from board to et cetera. So first of all is connect your beautiful ideas with an understanding and an empathy uh, of, regarding the needs of, of people. That's a, a key element. And the other important element is really to, to, to be aware that all these efforts won't be solved only by a social scientist or an engineer or an epidemiologist. As, as everyone could see here, the knowledge that we all bring to bear on issues is equally important. So is the case with the communities and the stakeholders we are working with. They know, they understand, and we need to pick their brains and to really be like, like a gardener, right? That, that brings the most beautiful elements of a plant to bear on whatever effort you want to do. So those are, for me, two key elements of working with communities that usually are excluded or with communities with whom I, at the beginning, feel like I don't know how to connect. So I, I, the, I'm sure everyone in the group knows more, but, uh, but really be humble, be, be sensitive. Don't start with, oh, this is what you need to do. Start with, what do you think we need to do? And go from there. Um, that, that's it. <laughs> do others of you want to want to jump into that question about improving social capacity during these times of transition? Uh, if I can just point out that I think there, there are different solutions, especially thinking about urban versus rural settings, and there are golden opportunities in, a, in a, an urban setting as far as transportation, housing, 
but also in the rural settings, I think that it's a golden opportunity for more distributed energy systems. Um, and I think mm -hmm. that's something that would be empowering. Uh, it's also job creating uh, and it, 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 it helps with rural communities quite a bit. Mm -hmm. That's sort of a nice, um, a, a nice segue to the next question, which, which is asking you all to dig in a little bit more deeply is to say, when you talk about transitions, what do you think in particular we need to change? And, and several of you have mentioned specifics. Um, does anybody want to want to continue with that? Maybe Alan to start with, you know, when we talk about transitions in, in your mind, what are the top two or three things that really need to change right now? Yeah, these are, these are big, hard ones, right? Um, so, I mean, I, I guess I'll, you know, I'll put my money where my mouth is and stick with a couple things I said in my part is that I, I really do believe, I don't have an easy answer to that, but that, you know, these forces of separation and social division um, have become worse and worse and worse. And we all know, it, and there's lots of cliche, but I really find them the biggest barrier. And they're, and they're, they're bad in this country, but they're not restricted to this country. And so, you know, being support elements for how we bring those down, um, you know, and, and Lisa pointed to it, right? Like both things can happen at once. You can have those forces be really strong and stand in a way at the same time that you can see, you know, a, a group as a whole move towards greater trust in the science and information. So where do we find an intersection and how do we intersect the best for those moments? But that that's the thing that worries me the most. And, you know, maybe the second thing I'll say is, is thinking about transitions in, in our own um, in, in our own scientific community and beyond. I mean, we've done it. I, I would argue that we've gone through a really impressive generation. Um, point to what you want, but you could start with, say, you know, Jane Lubchenco's social, social contract and the rest, and you look over back basically the last generation and how we operate within sustainability science today is almost unrecognizable compared to back then and a broad one. But we've got to do it again. You know, we've got to be willing, I think we're at this moment where taking those next set of risks, um, as I said, to get to go into areas that again make us uncomfortable to embrace areas that we feel might challenge our preconceived notions of what science can and can't do is probably going to be essential to have speedy change i'm um, go ahead lisa oh um you can see this is all tightly sort of orchestrated here um i want to if you think about sort of starting where you work I have to admit, right now, as the dean at a large university, I am very interested in ensuring that when we go forward from this, this moment, that we think about how we reward and incentivize scholarship. So it's not just sort of busting down the silos that Patty talked about, but it's also thinking about what does community engaged work look like and how does that sit together with discovery-oriented, peer-reviewed papers in terms of what we expect from ourselves as community of scholars and educators? And if we don't adjust our culture at this point in time, we're losing a huge opportunity. This would be a terrible crisis to, to waste, as they say. Yes, and, and speaking of a terrible crisis to waste, uh, you know, going beyond the universities, um, I think that as a society, if we can't make transformative change now during this time and get to a green economy, a, a green, healthy and sustainable economy, if we can't do that now, I don't think we ever can. I mean, this is, this is such an important time in our history that it is teaching us already the, the opportunity to how, how quickly society can, can act together. And this is out of fear right now, but to the extent that we're acting and understanding a global threat, a global pandemic, that this should carry over to other global threats like climate change and ecological destruction. And that, you know, to get there, I, I think we really do need, as Alan said, we need a Green New Deal that focuses on sustainability 
and equity, because without equity, it's exactly. not going to be sustainable. So we really need the, the full embrace of that type of social equity and environmental sustainability. And now is the time. I mean, if not now, I don't know when. Patty, do you want to add to that? Yeah, but I ju just one thing. I, 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 I really consider that we need to keep, and uh, Alan already said that we need, and also <laughs> everyone pointed to that, we need to keep our identities. We are researchers. This is what we do, right? But we are also citizens. So how can we bring the best of us to address the challenges and to be vulnerable? Because that's also what we are. We all are vulnerable. We all have uh, hope and fear and love and compassion and you name it. And so we need to bring that to, 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 to thinking and solving these challenges. And most importantly, we need to bring these new generations to be part of our program and to take over, you know, to say, to take this to the next stage. We need to do it. And I think as, as, as uh, Jonathan said, this is a huge opportunity. We cannot miss it. Even if we fail, yeah, that's part of life. Like a teenager when their father says, no, you shouldn't, shouldn't do this. Oh, let me live. Okay, let's leave it. Let's go for it. We need to take this opportunity. It's huge for us to miss it. That's great. I love that. Lisa, I'm going to return to you for just a moment um, to dig in a little bit to your reference to academic institutions and some of the changes and transformations that, that you are um, experiencing right now. And there was a question that came in uh, basically asking what needs to change in academic institutions? What are the needed reforms? And uh, this person is asking for some advice about what we can advocate for during this moment of change and crisis in order to affect that transformation. So I don't think I'm deeply reading tea leaves to say that um, coupled with this transformation is particularly for publicly supported universities, colleges and universities, we will see a decrease in our funding, whether it's through fewer students being able to afford to go to college, whether it's decrease in state funding, et cetera. So, you know, if we're in the midst of a lot is about a lot is about to change. And we could just take our universities and kind of keep them intact and kind of shrink them down and, you know, cut it, do these cuts on the basis of staff and, you know, ways in which we've sort of done things in the past. I think this is a moment when the silos we all have grown up with really can be busted down and sort of redesigned. Like what does the 21st century college and university need to look like in order to deliver learning opportunities to this set of students who are facing the sort of the global pandemic as well as the opportunities of knock on wood, a, a Green New Deal. What does it mean to do really integrated collaborative scholarship that spills over between the sciences, engineering, arts, humanities, the health sciences, et cetera. How, as we, can we not just contract, but instead can we take the resources and opportunities that we have and open up our eyes to the most important, highest priorities that we have in front of us and act on those while setting the things that we know are outdated. That's all. <laughs> That's great. Do, do either of the other three of you want to add to that about academic transformation? What should we be, what should we be advocating for right now within our own institutions? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in since I've been in this game for a while too. And, you know, I know for both, for both Lisa and me in this, I mean, we've, we've gone into these roles and, you know, deliberately set aside or put on the back shelf some of our own research 
for exactly this reason, a kind of recognition out of these networks that expanding knowledge to action out of the academy um, is going to take change. And this is a place where it's ironic, right? I mean, you know, we all joke about it, but higher ed institutions um, for all of what their mission is supposed to be are among the more conservative uh, businesses on the planet when it comes to change structurally for all kinds of, and that's a problem um, that's in front of us. And they don't do very well with top-down push in most cases. And there's lots that's lovely and wonderful about that that's structurally built in. But this is a moment where, you know, you wanna talk about being willing to be bold and advocate for things. Um, that means advocating for folks who are in position to make change in power, who are in leadership roles in these, to stick their necks out and go for it and take the heat. Um, because that's what we got to do, right? Like you're not going to see, you're not going to see some of those structural changes, those incentive changes that Lisa talked about, I think so beautifully and accurately happen without that being put in place and strongly backed and strongly upheld from the very top of these institutions. There's just no question for all that's good that if you wanted to put a map on them to say, how do you, if you stepped back and you said, how do you maximize the delivery of that body of knowledge into meaningful action, the long-term incentives and structures we have in place for higher ed are not well designed to do that. Um, so much of that happens on the edges rather than through the core of it. And so I, that means that means those of us who sit in these positions have got to be willing to just fall on swords and make it happen. And I'll speak uh, not as a dean, but as a professor that, you know, in, in a smaller way, in a more narrow way, we're trying to equip to understand linkages between the health of our planet and our own health. So we're doing some initiatives. We have a planetary health scholars program we've started. We're starting a brand new giant undergraduate course called Our Planet, Our Health. So at least as far as in content and trying to prepare the next generation, we're, we're trying to make that pivot. But I, it's definitely a bigger problem than just changing courses and, and develop, but this is something I'm trying at, at the professor level in any case. <laughs> Great, I wanna, I wanna get back to um, something that Patty and Jonathan both emphasized in their talks, and it's a question from a person in South Africa um, who says, my biggest concern about Sa South Africa along with most countries is the absolute need to regain some economic strength as soon as possible. This will naturally lead to business as usual. My question is what we think may be the first things to address in the transition. Of course, it would be helpful to address easier ones such as revising food waste, but what are some other ways? What are some first things? And, and Patty, you talked about um, energy, mobility. Jonathan, you also <laughs> talked about um, our, our foundation of, of fossil fuel use. If, if we could start with Patty and then Jonathan, and then if the other two of you want to jump in as well, um, what are the first things to address in this transition? So that we, well, that we maintain economic prosperity, but perhaps don't go back to the business as usual. Right. Well, I mean, <clears throat> particularly for Africa, for Latin America, where I am from, a, a focus on solar or a focus on or, or their alternative sources of energy that are cheaper. I mean, you have an initial uh, investment, but they are cheaper to maintain. They can be managed in a decentralized way. I mean, a focus on this, uh, this is key, a focus on micromobility and we are, and I'm telling you this, and I, I hope that my friends in the global South connect with me because I am pushing so much in my lab for, for our knowledge and capabilities to help Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia to, to exactly deal with this thing. So there are options to travel, to get solar, to get many of the good things that an alternative way of producing and living can bring. And I think that um, our countries have the possibility to leapfrog, and we are working a lot of, on that. Why do we need to repeat the mistakes of the United States or of Europe? Why don't just forgetting about their mistakes and just go in our own way with our own challenges, with our own capabilities and opportunities? So I think that there are many possibilities. And I think that also um, we need to work with local 
stakeholders and local academics who have a lot to contribute to identify those because they really understand how to get at them. So there are many options and really linking sustainability transitions as in energy and water transitions to the needs of people, resilience, uh, you know, uh, building resilience in terms of how can we have better houses, etc. Thinking of how people live, what they care about, what they feel proud about is the way to go. So there are already many things underway that we are piloting. I just need to be honest, and this is also showing how vulnerable I am. Alan, thank you for <laughs> reminding me this. We will commit, make mistakes, there will be trade-offs. That's what real life is about. And we need to be open to, to that and to learn from that. So options we have and some experience we do have too, but many in this community, all the participants have so much to bring and to contribute to, and we need to just accept it, learn from that. So options, yeah, we have many. <laughs> so That's great, thanks. Jonathan? So you know, I think the first thing we have to do is to correct this false narrative that it's the economy or the environment. And I think that, you know, we have seen with the price of renewables, uh, we're not waiting for solutions. They are here for the first time uh, ever, according mm -hmm. to the International Renewable Energy Agency, a couple of years ago, the report showed that the cheapest way to generate subsidies is with renewables and, and batteries. And so this is where we're in a different, different era where taking the green option is not necessarily more expensive. So we're in a different place in time there. The other is that there are far more jobs in the green economy than in the fossil fuel economy. And it's only from perverse subsidies that we're maintaining these, uh, you know, the fossil fuel industry. If, if we were to really um, go where the market is, the market is going to low carbon. But we also need that understanding that government needs to put some market signals on there as well. That we can't just be burning coal and oil and killing 7 million people every year from air pollution and not bring that impact, that damage into, into the market. So I think there needs to be price signals and, to protect the health, our health. But as far as you know, the economy goes, there is, there's, there's, golden, there's golden opportunities in a green economy. And I think this is a time to really, to, to really move to that and move in a serious way. Great, Jonathan, I have a follow-up for you, a specific question that says, um, can you please comment on ESGs? They have been doing really well, particularly with the crash in oil prices, which we know is related to reduced demand under COVID-19. So ESGs, what ESGs are? Um, I'm actually not sure, I thought you would know. <laughs> Speaking of vulnerability, probably it's yes, an environmentally sorry. sustainable something. <laughs> what is it, Alan? I mean, we're basically talking about social good funds and investments, right? So all kinds uh, of oh, sources right. of investments that have screens on them. I defer to Alan now. Good. <laughs> yeah, whether they're, uh, and, and I mean, actually, we've talked about this a lot at the college level and prior places where we are. And, and it's an interesting one. And I actually think this is a good one to bring up when we think about mechanisms, right? I mean, we hate to say it, it's cliched as hell, but it's true and money rules the world. And so how do we, how do we flip our perspective on that and start to engage um, as sustainability scientists and the rest for um, how we can help that transition and help those kinds of investment mechanisms push us forward? When are the right opportunities um, to engage at every level? So not, I mean, you know, the power is not an individual investor so much. It's in these large institutional investors and the rest are so changing their behavior. Um, one of the more fascinating conversations I ever had um, in one of these leadership roles was when, when I was at Duke um, with one of our faculty members there and then a woman who had spent almost 15 years 
fairly higher up, high up in Goldman, Goldman Sachs was then at the university and kind of teaching some of the, the basics of that, right, to the undergraduates there. And we had this great conversation about how do these ESGs really work? Um, what's the market for them? What's the control for them? And the potential where scientists like her in this network could help build a bridge um, to separate the wheat from the chaff, that there are a lot of bundled mechanisms out there, some of which might truly make a difference in terms of you invest in this and it really leads to something good, others which are basically just, you know, BS and greenwashing to get forward. So is there an opportunity for us to partner and elevate and help certify ourselves where those funds could make the biggest difference? And I think there's a lot of untapped power in that one. And I'll just add one thing to Alan's great answer, and that is this also shows the importance of public-private partnership. We need governments to send a signal that, you know, to invest that low carbon is the way to go and to, and to bring in the, the right kind of incentives. But without private, uh, private engagement, it won't be sustainable. So I think that's a really important point, uh, you know, as far as investment and looking at partnership between governments and the private sector. Absolutely. I, I just want to add something, which is, we might not do that, but we need to really collaborate with pressure groups that force that uh, lobby or you name it, the government to do so. Because uh, we know that there are also powerful forces that are against change. I mean, within the corporate world, there are some who are saying, no, we, we need to embrace this change. We need to promote it, etc." But the private sector is, and this is something we learn from sociology of expectation, is always expecting and say, okay, what are, what will the, the, how will the regulations look like? And based on that, what is what I need to do? So I think that we need to uh, partner with pressure groups, with people that Praise the government to act accordingly, because otherwise we won't be able to have these connections, or we won't be as as uh, as uh, as um, transformational as we want to be. Lisa, do you want to jump in and, and respond to that? Um, what are the first things to address in the transition so we we don't fall back to business as usual? I think working on building the coalitions between the more vulnerable populations and communities and those that have motivation to share power. And I think it's um, being looking hard in the face of the fact that this is about money and power and it will be about building coalitions that start to eat away at the, the hold that that has on current business as usual. Good, so we've had, we've had a, a several questions addressing and appreciating the fact that you all have addressed the inequity issue that arises in COVID-19 in, in reactions to climate change and so forth. And so one of, the, one of the themes that's coming up is how do we begin to address that given the positions that we are all in? How do we um, address those inequities either through collaborative networks or through community engaged research? What are the ways in which you see might be most successful for us to pursue moving forward to address some of those inequities? I'll start with Alan and then maybe Patty and Jonathan and Lisa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. Um, I mean, the first thing I want to say is that I'm not going to pretend to be the expert on this. I mean, if there's one lesson to learn, it's like the, the first principle of this is that we listen first as strongly and fully as we can to those communities who are affected and let them tell us. Um, you know, th that's one. The, the, the second thing I would say is that, you know, and, and I've seen this at a lot of levels, including at the full institutional level at the college right now and work that we are doing here, well beyond sustainability stuff. This has to become a constant part of our daily decision making, large and small. Um, it, it is too often, it's not that there's not importance there, but it's too often relegated um, in practice to second or third tier and ancillary rather than central to how decisions are made across the board. And that just has to be daily practice and daily institutional and otherwise policy for how you make change. 
And the third, I might say, kind of refers to a bit even to Lisa's portrayal of, of academic institutions changing. We've got to reframe in our minds um, what expertise and knowledge is and, and how we do that, right? And so if, if, we're, if we're always going to be stuck in our fairly classical definitions of where expertise is coming from and what contributions mean and those who get invited to the table have to pass through the gates that are those traditionally defined gates of having a contribution, we're not getting out of this. Um, and, and so that's got to be really active from those on the top, whether it's forming groups that come together, whether it's making decisions to participate or not in something, depending on those principles all across the rest, so that that's elevated. Okay, I think you said that I was the next. Um, I, as, like Alan, I feel very humbled by the question. Uh, but I, I see opportunities to address those inequalities in our workplace by making sure that we question assumptions and uh, expectations about whether, for instance, a Latino or Latina should be part of the, uh, the, the, uh, the faculty or uh, how, how to involve a, a people uh, from communities that are usually excluded. So we, uh, there are many ways in which in our laboratories and our faculties, we can address that. I see other options which are related to work with communities, vulner vulnerable communities, poor communities, and to really try to engage with them. And from, again, I insist not from our perspective of what they need, we think they need, but really listening a lot and being humble and learning a lot about what they can contribute to the conversation. And there are other ways, right? We can contribute as citizens by making sure that, you know, we do what we do, calling senators, et cetera. So I, I see many ways in which we can do it. I just uh, feel that this is an effort where we all need to network and connect and create coalitions because as individuals, we, there is not so much we can do. It's, it's only by the coming together of us as this community we are, that we will be able to really think about this and, and find ways to address and to learn from good practices and also bad practices um, moving forward. So Sharon, um, I have two points to your very challenging question. Uh, the first point is that this pandemic is completely revealing how incredibly inequitable our health system is. Um, and, you know, that this health inequity issue is just laid bare from what we're seeing as far as vulnerability. And it's, it's that much more of a wake up call that this is not a functioning system and that we need to do better. That's the, the more proximate awareness issue. But the other one is an environmental issue. And when you think about the level of consumption of natural resources and they, the, you know, the, the multinational corporate world and how they're extracting resources, that is stealing resources from communities. And that's not a level playing field. So I think there's the you know, the health equity vulnerability piece that shows the flaws in our system. But the other is at the starting end of this, that we are, as we completely uh, take from nature and in an unsustainable manner, it's completely unfair. And, you know, it leaves the people that are most vulnerable to poverty and lack of resources and lack of na access to natural resources. It's, it's completely in balance. So I think there's that aspect of, of you know, a green, green economy and conservation that it's not for the sake of conservation, it's for the sake of humanity and all, all the species, but it's really being selfish about it. We need uh, more conservation and sustainable uh, development. And, and that, that, that I think is really uh, some mes a message that is global and extremely important. Mm -hmm. So 
one of the joys and challenges of being on a panel with such great colleagues is that um, when you're the last person, you need to say, yeah, you know, what, what they said. And, um, but one way I'd like to answer it is, is actually quite personal. So all of you probably have these committees or initiatives that are about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and probably not all of you write as many memos as I do, but sort of imagine the life of a dean, and I write memos, and I write memos, and I write memos. And literally, several years ago, I was writing a memo, and I wrote diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I stopped in my tracks when I typed inclusion, and I thought, what do I actually mean? And realized that at that point in time, I was really thinking about inclusion as some kind of like we had a pipeline and more people got included. And when they showed up at our college, we weren't jerks. Like we had done some workshops and we knew what microaggressions were. And it was kind of like this absence of crumminess versus like a positive vision of something. I mean, I really did just literally stop. And um, when we think about inclusion as a way in which we are going to start to work, we have to be prepared to be transformed ourselves. This isn't about collaborations that are handshakes between academics and vulnerable communities, which actually might be deeply resilient communities that have a lot to learn and that we ourselves will be profoundly changed and our institutions will be changed and we have to open up that possibility. That is so wonderful and we are about two minutes from the end of our time and I think that is a great place for us to um, wrap up our speakers comments. I'd like to thank all of you who participated today. This was a great gathering. Many people, this webinar is recorded, so it will be available to you. I wanna thank all of you who shared your thoughts and questions and comments, and I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to all of them, but I think we had a great um, input of, of questions and comments. I'd like to thank Future Earth and the Earth Leadership Program for their support in designing and organizing this event. And I'd like to thank the panelists once again um, for your leadership, your commitment to sustainability and to society, and for your generosity in offering your observations and insights to all of us today. So big, big round of applause for all of you. And to all of us, um, to all of you, may you be safe and well as we continue to navigate through this time of reflection, action, transformation, and uh, dare I say hope. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. <laughs> what an Thank honor you. to be with you. <laughs> <laughs> Build back better. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs>